Welcome. Uh, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, whatever time zone you're in. Um, and welcome to the plenary webinar, the plenary panel of the first inaugural Black Trailblazers in Engineering uh, workshop here at Purdue. Um, this workshop is being held uh, in addition to uh, as a part of the Black Trailblazers in Engineering program. Uh, today's panel uh, is also being co-hosted as part of our Engineering Rising to the Challenge uh, series, uh, where uh, we bring uh, engineering professionals and thought leaders uh, from around the world, really leaders in their fields, uh, to come together to unpack some of the challenges posed by uh, the, uh, the pandemic and beyond. Um, and to introduce uh, the proceedings for today, uh, I would like to uh, present uh, our fearless leader, um, the John A. Edwardson Dean of Engineering, Meng Chiang, who is also the Roscoe George Distinguished Professor of Electrical Computer Engineering. Over to you, Meng. Thank you very much, Arvind. First of all, a mic check. Can you hear me? Great. Uh, I still make the rookie mistakes of uh, forgetting to unmute myself, uh, not on this most important event. I'm glad that uh, you can join us here tonight. Uh, as Arvin mentioned, welcome to the inaugural uh, Black Trail Blazers in Engineering Workshops, uh, three-day workshop, but tonight we have an outstanding plenary panel webinar. And on the site where NASB was founded, and during um, the month of Black History Month, uh, we at Purdue Engineering are proud to inaugurate and present the Black Trailblazers in Engineering Workshop to prepare future trailblazing faculty in engineering with a special focus on preparing scholars who are also committed to increasing the success of Black engineers. And these fellows, as I understand, there are 19 of them, will attend a virtual four day workshop designed for scientific interactions career-oriented discussions, and networking with leading Black faculty, starting today through the next four days. We also have a sequence of very exciting and important events, including the next uh, hour and a half, but also uh, tomorrow and on Friday. So please uh, join us along with uh, the fellows, uh, and we welcome the widest participation to these events. And I want to thank Arvid and his team. I want to thank uh, Mark Lundstrom, the acting dean uh, over the past uh, year. And I want to thank the outstanding teams uh, in the minority in engineering program, not only for what they have been able to do to give us this inaugural workshop, but even more importantly, for the tireless work that they have been doing over decades, decades in the past and decades in the future. And we must act certainly with a sense of urgency. Now I'm very glad to say that we have uh, in just this month, for example, uh, unleashed a substantial set of resources, human and financial resources, uh, to increase our undergraduate representation of African American and Black engineering students. Now, this workshop is geared towards the other side of this important pipeline and community building. And to kick off uh, this workshop with this plenary panel, we have four truly outstanding trailblazers and they will be introduced by and the panel moderated by our own Professor Barrett Caldwell. So I will have the pleasure to introduce the moderator for tonight's panel. Professor Caldwell is a professor of industrial engineering and by courtesy of aeronautics and astronautics. He's one of the first few African-American professors that our college has been able to recruit. And over the years, he has been a leader in many ways. He's a fellow of the Human Factors and Ergonomics Society. 
and since 2002, so for 19 years now, served as director of the NASA-funded Indiana Space Grant Consortium. In 2016, I think Professor Caldwell also served in public service as a Jefferson Science Fellow at the US Department of State. And he was assigned to the Environment Science Technology Health Policy in the Office of Japanese Affairs in the State Department. And as some of you know, that Professor Caldwell uh, has been very widely regarded as a leading scholar, teacher, and as you can see, the impact of his engagement effort is also wide and deep. So it is a real pleasure to welcome now to the virtual stage, if you will, and give us this incredibly important evening Barrett Caldwell, Professor Caldwell, thank you so much. And thank you to all the four panelists that will be introduced by you now, please. Thank you, Dean Cheng. Uh, thank you for the wonderful introduction. I uh, appreciate it very much. In some ways, this feels like a gathering of like-minded folk who have taken a variety of pathways to uh, the top of, shall we say, several varied mountains that all have their own unique perspectives. And each one of them is a thought leader and pioneer in their own right. And we could spend a lot of time uh, talking about the achievements of e each and every one of them. I will take just a couple of minutes uh, for each person to uh, introduce them and to provide a little bit of view of their perspective. First, I'd like to introduce Christine Grant. She is a professor of chemical and biomolecular engineering at North Carolina State University and the inaugural associate dean of faculty advancement. She's a fellow and the 2021 president elect of the American Institute of Chemical Engineers and a life member of Society of Women Engineers, SWE, National Society of Black Engineers, NSBE, NCNW, and ACES. Uh, she obtained her uh, bachelor degree uh, in chemical engineering from Brown University and her graduate work, both master's and doctorate from the Georgia Institute of Technology. She's been recognized for broadening the participation, promotion, and retention of underrepresented minorities and women in STEM, receiving a number of awards, including the NSF Presidential Award for Excellence in Science, Math, and Engineering Mentoring. She's authored the Elsevier book, Success Strategies for Women in STEM, a Portable Mentor, and contributed multiple other book chapters to uh, diversity in STEM. Second, Maimon Powers Jr. Maimon has been in the construction industry for more than 40 years. He began his career with Amico and then joined his father at Powers and Sons Construction Company in 1971 after completing his bachelor's uh, degree in civil engineering from Purdue. Uh, Maimon is a registered professional engineer in the state of Indiana and over his time as treasurer and then president and now uh, chair of the board of uh, Powers and Sons Construction, the company switched its focus from purely residential to commercial and industrial construction and grew to be one of the largest African-American owned construction companies in the country. He provides strategic direction and leadership as firm's chairman and CEO. And he's also, also managed to uh, been actively involved in various organizations that serve the construction industry and the community as a whole, including as a board chairman for Methodist hospitals, uh, the regional bank board of directors of the Fifth Third Bank Chicago region, World President's Organization, chief executive organization, number of others, but I would be remiss if I did not mention 
that one of his main services has been to Purdue University as a member of the Board of Trustees from 1996 when he was uh, appointed by Governor Evan Bayh until 2011. In his final term, he served as the Vice Chairman of the Board. And in 2014, Maiman was awarded an, doc an honorary doctorate in engineering from Purdue. Next, Tony Harris. Anthony Tony Harris is the current president and CEO of Campbell Harris Security Equipment Company, manufacturer of density meters and contraband detection equipment for contraband of all types, including explosives and dirty bombs. Harris is a 1975 Purdue graduate with a BS in mechanical engineering and an MBA from the Harvard Graduate School of Business. Tony was recognized by uh, the university as a Purdue Outstanding Mechanical Engineer in 1999, Distinguished Engineering Alumnus in 2008, and an honorary degree in engineering, uh, an honorary doctorate degree in engineering in 2013. Some of you may also recognize Tony as uh, one of the founders of the National Society of Black Engineers and he currently serves on the organization's National Advisory Board. Fourth, Virginia Lynn Booth Womack, um, a Hoosier native from Indianapolis and also a Purdue University graduate with a BS degree in industrial engineering and a BA in psychology uh, after my own heart. Uh, she has 18 years of experience in engineering manufacturing and has decided to return as a PhD student in engineering education while she is still the director of the Minority Engineering Program, a position that she's held since 2004. She has helped, used her engineering background to address retention and academic performance gaps between underrepresented minority engineering students and the majority population. First year retention rates for under underrepresented minority students under her leadership has grown from 63 to 95% and first year academic performance has increased 40%. She has served as the national president of the National Association of Multicultural Engineering Program Advocates, an engineering organization, well, a broader engineering organization that has a legacy of best practices and effective programming in outreach, recruitment, retention, and academic excellence. And just by going through these background statements, there's a lot to uh, cover today. So I think we're gonna get right to that. So let's start with an opening statement, brief uh, statement, I'm going to ask the panelists to share a pivotal experience that served as a turning point for you in your ability to have and share the influences that you are now demonstrating in your career. And Tony, can I start with you? Sure, Merritt. First of all, uh, let me uh, say how excited and honored I am to be a part of this. And I want to thank you, Barrett, and I want to thank Arvin and and Stephanie and, and Mung, I really appreciate the Nesby shout out. Thank you all for pulling this together. I really hope this becomes a, an ongoing session and, and not just during Black History Month, but uh, a way for us to engage throughout the, throughout the year and, and years to come. So I was thinking about some uh, pivotal turning points in, in my career that um, that might fit this discussion. I thought I'd go back to while I was a student on campus and uh, share with you one of those experiences. But before I did that, I need to establish a context. So in the early 70s, you know, it was uh, the first time uh, predominantly white institutions like Purdue were admitting large numbers of black students following the turmoil of the 60s and the riots and all that stuff. And, for the first time, we were beginning to, to make appearances uh, on campuses. There were very few of us. Uh, out of the 32,000 students at Purdue, there were only about 170 African-American students total. <clears throat> and in my incoming class, 
of 8,000 engineers, there were 25 African Americans. Most of us had uh, come from big inner city high schools. Uh, and uh, we, while we were doing really well in those schools, we really weren't prepared for the rigor of a Purdue. For instance, Chicago Public Schools, where I was from, uh, they did not offer calculus, even in the technical high school that I attended. So we were relatively uh, unprepared. There was little or no structured academic support systems in place. There were, there were very, very few women. And out of the 25 uh, women that matriculated with me or students that African-American students that matriculated with me, there was only one uh, African-American female. There was no black faculty and very few black students going into grad school. Companies were beginning to start trying to recruit African-American graduates, but they really claimed to not be able to find us. So there were very few job opportunities, even upon graduating. <clears throat> Now, several universities had begun to organize clubs, the Black Student Unions, the uh, Black Societies of Engineering and Math around the country. So this was the context with which I'm about to share. So in my junior year, I became uh, president of the student chapter of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, ASME. And as president, I had an opportunity to attend their national conference with several other uh, students at Purdue and the conference was held in New York City at Madison Square Garden. And this was the first time I had an opportunity to experience a national organization up close and personal. At the national conference there, students and professionals were networking, they were sharing uh, work experiences, they were sharing projects they were working on, they were sharing study habits, they were, there was even a, a small job fair, so they, they were, there were job opportunities that were leveraging these experiences all around the country. And <clears throat> this was a huge eye opener for me. You know, I was truly excited about this. And as we began to come back to Purdue, I began to talk about wouldn't it be great if black students had an opportunity to do this kind of networking and leveraging all across the country. It was uh, exciting times. And as I talk about the vision and not the process, you know, people would get excited about it. If you talked about, as I talk with others about the end game of what would it look like if we did this and not talked about how we would get to do that, uh, people would get excited and, and uh, develop a lot of buy-in. That was a, a true learning experience for me. <clears throat> As we got back to campus with the support of what was then freshman engineering, that ultimately became the minority engineering uh, programs office, I was able to identify who the deans were of the accredited universities cross country, write, <coughs> excuse me, write each of them a letter asking them to put me in touch with someone on campus and talked about wouldn't it be great if we could do this on a national basis and uh, in 1975, we were able to attract 80 students from across the country to Purdue University to form the, the very first conference of the National Society of Black Engineers. The rest, as they say, is history. NSBE has now 30,000 plus members and allies. We've got uh, over 400 chapters. There are 4,000 international members. Um, there's a uh, 40 full-time paid professional staff in a building that the organization owns with a $14 million annual budget impacting minority students from K through 12 all the way through the pipeline and into the professional arena where there are 3,800 professional members as well. So that small opportunity for me as a Purdue student and ASME has resulted in what I now get to share with you all as a part of the history of the National Society of Black Engineers. Thank you, Tony. Virginia, can I ask you to go next? Since uh, you seem to have uh, had a very close seat for some of this activity. So my experience uh, at Purdue, uh, pivotal experience. So I came in as a psych major uh, because I wanted to solve the world's problems. 
And until uh, I met Tony, he told me I wasn't going to get paid. <laughs> he said, you're not going to make no money unless you get your PhD. And I was like, oh, my God. And, you know, I thought about 12 years. I said, oh, no, I can't. And so I didn't know a lot about college. You know, I'm one of five children and the only one that graduated from high school and the only one that went to college. So it was just alien to me. I was walking around on campus totally clueless about um, the college experience and definitely not aware of what engineering was. So I learned about engineering. I, I met the Chicago Six and I met other engineering students that were also on campus. And I, I learned that engineering would op open up opportunities for me that I wouldn't have been able to dream of, you know, in my younger years. So I did change my major and it was a challenge because like Tony, I did not have preparation for engineering, but I had the desire to be successful. And um, it was when, when Nesby was started, I was there and it was amazing to see all the students come from all over the country. It was a very exciting time for engineering students then and we were able to fellowship with each other and learn about each other's uh, situations on different campuses. And after uh, Tony graduated and some of the others, I think uh, Ed Coleman graduated too the same year, uh, we kept Nesby going. And it was an initiative that started at Purdue, but there were a lot of schools that were doing similar work. So eventually, President Hansen, who, who was an advocate for Nesby during my time at Purdue, he challenged me to run for national chair. And I laughed, I said, they never elect me, you know, plus I'm a, uh, I didn't feel intimidated by being a woman, but back in that day, it wasn't necessarily something women would pursue, but he gave me his backing and let me know that if I won, he'd provide us with an office and he would support the effort and serve as a mentor. So I went to the conference that year and uh, I won. I won national chair. And I think what really made it sell for the other students was the fact that I had a university president behind me and we needed that type of advocacy in that day. And to his word, he supported me. He uh, had me speak at the National Academy of Science, which was a very intimidating opportunity. But at that particular conference, I think it was the National Academy of Science. They were doing a, um, a search for how do we get more engineers involved in engineering and STEM fields. And because Nesby had been started, they wanted to hear a student's perspective. And that uh, opened the door for me to talk to a lot of corporate CEOs and other educators that attended that event. And it was amazing how things uh, developed from there. I got a standing ovation and a lot of corporations began to look at Nesby as an investment opportunity. So I served as national chair for two consecutive terms in office. Um, that had never happened before. Of course, we were young. And uh, I found myself totally immersed in the advocacy for the program. It wasn't something that I wanted to do because it would give you a lot of attention. It was something I wanted to do because I needed to be successful. And I wanted to make sure that when you're talking about student success, listen to the students because they are in it, they're going through it. So I would say that's the most pivotal uh, experience that I've had. I've got others, but I don't want to take too much more time. So I turn it back over. Thank you, Virginia. Maimon, how about you? Again, thank you, uh, Barrett, and uh, certainly thank you to Mung and uh, Arvin and all those that helped put uh, this program together. I'll just echo uh, Tony's uh, opening remarks. Uh, it's uh, certainly a pleasure for us to be able to share our experiences and uh, relive some of those uh, exciting times that uh, we've had as we've uh, uh, built our careers. I'm a little older than uh, Virginia and Tony. I was actually here uh, before them. I started in 1966. So um, uh, my experiences were very similar to Tony's. Um, uh, there was no uh, calculus offered in my high school. So you started off uh, very much behind when you came to Purdue. But the pivotal points for me 
uh, and there are probably two of them that, that uh, brought me to Purdue and, and, and one that continues to uh, motivate me today that uh, I talk about almost every time I speak uh, because it still is motivation to me is that uh, in my uh, 10th grade geometry class, we had an African-American student teacher from Purdue. He was a math major and he pulled the smartest young man in the class aside, which was not me, but it was a friend of mine. So I, I just simply eavesdropped on the conversation. And he told the young man that he ought to consider going to Purdue majoring in engineering. He said, because there are no African-American registered professional engineers in the state of Indiana. And so eavesdropping on the conversation, I decided that was something I was going to do and set that as a goal uh, when I was in the uh, 10th grade. Following that, when I told my uh, parents, my father specifically, that I wanted to go to Purdue and major in engineering, uh, he found three African-American engineers for me to meet, uh, to serve as, a, I'll call it mentors, if you will, uh, or inspiration. And uh, two of them could never get a job in corporate America. Um, they worked in, one worked in the steel mill, one worked in the post office. Uh, it's just basic labor jobs. The third though, uh, actually went to Purdue and majored in uh, civil engineering. And his is a story that I tell all the time. Uh, and he shared with me that when he was a student at Purdue, uh, he could not live on campus, that he had to be back across the river by sundown every night uh, into the black community of Lafayette. And yet he graduated in civil engineering and, it, and ultimately started his own firm because he, he, um, <laughs> he, right now everybody does, if you will, telework and maybe he invented that because he did get a job with an engineering firm downtown, but they wouldn't let him come into the office. So he had to come into the mailroom, get his assignments and take it home and then turn it back in. But the motivation for me was the fact that he was able to graduate, could not live on campus, could not go to the library after sundown, um, could not eat in any of the uh, dining facilities, but yet he still graduated. So every time I'd become a little disappointed with uh, how the world was treating me and the challenges of uh, Purdue and uh, you know, uh, the calculus classes, the physics classes, et cetera, um, I thought about him and uh, the fact that uh, he was able to graduate and couldn't even live on campus and I could go to the library every day. And so what I'd simply say to myself was suck it up and study. This is not that hard, you can do it. So that was a pivotal thing for me that I still talk about today that still motivates me today. Thank you, that's, Thank you. that's a powerful story. Thank you. Christine. Thank you. Well, thank you to the organizers and uh, Barrett for uh, moderating this panel. So I, I wanted to, to talk about mentoring. So I think for me, the concept of mentoring and coaching has been one of the pivotal things that's been a theme throughout what has happened to me along the way. And I wanted to, to give a couple of points and then, and then bring it back to this NSBE connection. You know, whether it was Dr. Howard Adams coming to General Electric Research Development Center um, in the summer when I finished my freshman year at Brown University to talk to us about being GEM fellows and going to graduate school that was back in 19, oh my goodness, 1980, 81, probably 1981 uh, that, that we first met or whether it was um, Matt Terrell at University of Minnesota and David Terrell at Caltech, two white males who were brothers who took me under their wing uh, after I got tenure at NC State to come and do mini sabbaticals and supported me. Um, or whether it was the mentoring that I got in the American Institute of Chemical Engineers over the years by people who didn't look like me that encouraged me to continue to, to participate that now I find myself as the president of the organization, which has um, you know, about 40,000 or more members in 110 countries. Um, so there's a lot of mentoring stories. I know we all have them. I think that that's a theme for me. I would say that uh, though, that the one, one thing that happened to me that was really pivotal, I shared with this group and I was trying to find a way to make it pivotal. So it is pivotal. Um, I was at the Emerging Research Network Conference in Washington, DC last year, last uh, January, February. And one of my colleagues who's at NC State, Joel Ducast, 
um, we had a booth. It's, it's basically a conference for uh, individuals to go and present their research, whether it's via um, uh, poster presentation or oral presentations competition, mostly um, minority underrepresented students from a number of different institutions, from a number of different programs. It's probably, I don't know, a thousand or two people that go to this meeting. And so NC State had a booth there. And my colleague who went to RPI uh, was talking to some different people. And so he went over to the RPI booth. He's a professor now at NC State, but he went to RPI um, as a student. He went to the RPI booth and he met these this woman and this man. And he said, oh, I think you might know someone that Christine Grant knows. And they said, he said, okay, let's go meet her. So he brought them back over to the booth and we started talking. And it turned out that we all knew another person that some of you may know, Janet Rutledge, who was a student there. So when I was the president of uh, NSBE at Brown University back in 83, 84, uh, she was at uh, either at RPI or she was on the national stage. I can't remember which one. But anyway, we had this connection. And I looked at this woman and I said, you look familiar to me. I don't know why, but you look familiar to me. She had a very distinctive look. And I thought, and she said, no, I, I don't think we know each other. And so then I said to her, "Where you know, you went to RPI. And they said, did you go to RPI? I said, no, I didn't go to RPI. So then I said to her, wait a minute. Did you used to to go from RPI in Troy, New York, which is on one side of the river, to the other side of the river, to Albany, New York, to tutor young people in the inner city at the Urban League. And they said, no, nah, no, nah, we didn't. And then they looked at it and they said, you know what, we did, didn't we do that? And they said, then they started recollecting how they used to, they got a van and they drove over to uh, Albany and they met these students one of them was me sitting in a, in a classroom. I was probably a freshman in high school and I was eager to find out about what engineering was and eager to be tutored in math and they were the ones. And so here we are, I can't do the math, I should be able to do it. What, 40 something years later that met and I was able to thank them and they were still doing the work and I'm doing the work alongside them. So where does this come back together? It comes back to what Tony said initially, is that when they were doing this work at Purdue, there were students at RPI that were doing the same work and paving the way and mentoring and providing a pathway for students to come behind them. So pivotal to me, um, pivotal events have been mentoring and coaching by people who look like me and people who don't look like me, who took me under their wings. And it has inspired and encouraged me to do the same thing. Um, and it's just great to be on the panel with these folks too. So thank you, Christine. I, I love to hear those stories. Um, we could tell those stories all night, I promise you. Um, but the, the, the time clicks on. Uh, so thank you all for those experiences. And uh, we'll, we'll start out with, with uh, an easier question uh, from the uh, list of possible questions. And often we talk about uh, mentors and admiring heroes. And I would like to ask you all, who do you admire as a black hero, a STEM hero, who may not be the best known, but is definitely the real McCoy. And I have to throw that out because Elijah McCoy is one of my heroes for the uh, automatic oiler, which I liked even before I got to Purdue, but <laughs> one of the most profoundly transformative uh, engineering inventions to uh, advance uh, railroad transport. But how about the rest of you? Anybody? I'd like to mention mine. So I have a male and a female. The male is uh, Father Barna Fitzhardy. Now, he was not um, an engineer, but this is his picture. I'll move my head over. He actually looked like um, uh, Frederick Douglass <laughs> with white hair. This man gave me a job when I was in high school working at Martin Center College. And now Martin University is in existence in, in the city of Indianapolis. And it's, um, I think it's, it's an HBCU. 
But Father Boniface saw something in me and told me I needed to go to college. And I didn't even, I had never thought about college. And he met my mother and told her, I needed to go to college and I needed to go to Purdue. And that's how I got here. He provided a scholarship. And uh, had it not been for him, I don't know where I'd be today. And the other uh, person I just wanted to mention that is not known as an engineer, but it's Harriet Tubman. When you think about what she did to get all of those people transported from where they were to safety, that is just amazing. And I will forever be indebted to the, the example that she set, not only for women, but for the, for the struggle that we all have to be willing to sacrifice in order to change the future. Well, I'm glad uh, Virginia picked two because now I get to pick two also. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Male well, and female. The, the first was my um, uh, drafting, high school drafting teacher, Ash Will Wright was his name. He's the first person I ever heard use the term engineering. And uh, he established a chapter of the JETS, the Junior Engineering Technical Society at Robert T. Lindblom Technical High School. And this, this is a huge high school, 4,000 students there. And uh, through the Jets, we got to visit Northwestern and Chicago Circle and got to talk to engineering students and, and really got a chance to understand a little bit about what engineering was. And I wanted to be an architect. And he told me, he says, you know, Tony, the way architects make money is they bring business to the firm through their family connections. He says, you don't have any family connections. He says, the way engineers make money is by being smart. He says, you can be smart. So <laughs> he was smart. The other I gotta say is a, another Purdue alum, Dr. Arthur J. Bond. Dr. Bond was a, a graduate engineering student at Purdue while I was, uh, when I enrolled, matriculated as a freshman. And he took me and several others under his wing and kind of taught us more of the, um, should I say the, the social, um, mannerisms and mechanisms to get through Purdue. He, he told us not to wear stocking caps and don't braid your hair in class and, and those kinds of things, you know, to, to help us navigate between the lines. He ultimately became one of the uh, faculty supporters of, of Nesby and, and is considered one of the founding fathers as well. So I'll go next, if that's okay. Yep. Um, and uh, this is a fact I found uh, strictly by uh, accident. And, uh, and I'll even go back a little bit on the story. So as I indicated earlier, I became a registered professional engineer. And about eight or nine years ago, uh, they started requiring that you do uh, continuing ed. And I thought, well, I really don't want to do continuing ed. I think you know, I'm about ready to retire and that's just a lot of work. I'm, I'm not going to do it. Uh, I happened to play golf with a gentleman that was about 85 years old and he was a doctor and he said to me, um, I've, got to, I've got to stop this afternoon and I've got to take, I have to take my continuing ed class. And I said, well, you're 85 years old. Why are you still taking continuing ed? He said, I worked too hard to get that medical degree to let it go over continuing ed. So from that point on, I've always studied and taking, taken my continuing ed classes uh, for my uh, registered professional engineer license. So I will encourage all of you to do the same. In the process of doing that, you pick classes and I happened to pick a class and I think it was on inventors. I can't remember uh, exactly, but I was amazed to find that there was a gentleman by the name of Lonnie Johnson, who was from Tuskegee and he invented what's called the super soaker, water gun. And I think this was actually by accident because he was into rockets and things of that nature, but he was, a pro he was and is a prolific inventor. And so from that super soaker uh, water gun, and I went right away to my closet to find out that I had one of those uh, with my uh, children. Uh, he al also invented the Nerf gun. And then he was astute enough to patent his invention and then market it. And so one company, um, Lanier, actually bought the marketing rights to it. That company was acquired by Has Hasbro. Hasbro then began to continue to market it. And Hasbro actually tried to cheat him out of his royalties that he was to receive. So he had to sue Hasbro 
uh, and they paid him $73 million about eight or nine years ago. Uh, so many of you are going to be the, the fellows, are, I'm sure will be inventors. And uh, so make sure that you uh, patent your products. But the Super Soaker was invented by uh, an African-American male from uh, Tuskegee Institute, who actually ended up with a degree, I think, in nuclear engineering. Uh, a PhD in nuclear engineering. So great story. And he, and he is an inventor for a living. He has a, a facility and he has other scientists working with him. Thank you, Maimon. Christine. So uh, following Virginia and Tony's lead, I'm going to do two. So um, my first one is Dr. Shirley Malcolm. Um, Dr. Malcolm is the head of education and human resources. She's almost retired, semi-retired at the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And I had met her over, over the years. She was one of the authors, uh, along with a group of other women of color of the double bind, talking about being a woman and, and uh, of color um, in the STEM Academy or the STEM, not just the Academy, but in the STEM field. And I met her at a few meetings and I remember actually there's a Purdue connection. There's a Purdue connection for everything, right? Purdue people, yeah. So I was at a Purdue meeting um, for uh, early career faculty. Uh, I, was, I was doing a keynote at a dinner and I think she was also a keynote um, at another session. And I was just so impressed with her uh, that and Virginia and I were talking, I like to make jewelry. And so there's a shop in Purdue, some of you know, on one of these side streets that sells beads and lots of other stuff. So I remember going down to the shop and buying something and making her uh, a brooch or a pendant, you know, and giving it to her at this meeting because I was so impressed with her. I really enjoyed interacting with her. And um, several years later, I approached her about coming to do a mini sabbatical. Uh, I said, you don't have to pay me. I just want to, you know, just want to follow you around. And so I had an opportunity to go to, to AAAS in Washington uh, for part of a year and just just be in meetings with her, go to the White House, just follow, I paid my own way. You know, it was just, it was amazing. Uh, and I, I really enjoyed that experience. And then the second person who I've met once or twice is John Slaughter. Some of you may know him. John Slaughter was the, um, he's African-American, was the first director, um, or first African-American director at the National Science Foundation. Um, president of University of Maryland College Park. He's in the National Academy. Um, and he wrote a book a few years ago with a group of people that I had an opportunity to edit on African, the history of African-Americans in engineering. And so that's somebody who I just was looking up last night for something else. And so um, these are folks who, uh, some of them are, are well-known, some of them not so much, but for uh, early career uh, uh, engineers and for students, if they're not known to you, then they're unknown, right? So you should go look them up. So those are my two. Okay, thank you. So as some of you may know, we've had some discussions on the Purdue campus about uh, the uh, response of the campus and the response of the students on the campus to the social justice conflicts and, and concerns of the past year, which for some of us was not just the past year. And I'm going to direct this uh, question to Virginia. Uh, what do you see as similar and different between your student experiences interacting with Hubdi Hall, Purdue administration, uh, during your early Nesby years and you've gotten also experience the current student uh, experiences, including some of the students that were involved uh, with the Nesby Call to Action and other student uh, engagement with the administration uh, leading to and through the Purdue Equity Task Force. How do you see that, that connection? How do you see the, that evolution? Mute. Virginia, you're muted again. Sorry. I don't know why I do that. <laughs> well, actually, my husband was making noise, so I had to mute that time. Okay, great question. Uh, Barrett, thank you for asking. It's a very deep question. Uh, I'll try to answer it 
succinctly without at you know without doing too much talking but i was here in the 70s i was here when nesby was founded in 1974 there were 27 african americans in the college of engineering um, as freshmen in 2020 the number was 23. So I've seen an actual complete round circle. And the question is, how did we get there? Nesme was founded here. And the, the year after Nesme was founded, the number of African-American freshmen went up to 75. And there were years where the numbers went as high as, I believe, 92 as a freshman incoming class. Of course, we had affirmative action. There were a lot of funds that were available and it was sort of a mandate that we do that. And times have changed. There have been a lot of legal uh, court cases against affirmative action now. And we've seen that uh, hit California, Michigan and other areas. And you know, legally universities are really taking a conservative stand and I understand that, but we are determined to do better Dean Monk has already mentioned it. The university has, has a call to action. And one of the stimulators for that call was the National Society of Black Engineers in a very strong way. I see students reacting. I see students standing up. There are organizations on campus and they're very serious about being active in, in looking for change and demanding the change. And, and I'm seeing a response today that I don't think would have happened back in the 70s. We were fortunate to have President Arthur Hansen, and he was an advocate. They called him the student's president. He was an advocate for diversity. And I think we have advocacy now for diversity. It's just a lot of things have changed and we're seeing the impact of the structural nature of exclusion. And yes, we can say the structural nature of how exclusion and systematic uh, policies literally support racism, whether directly or indirectly. So there are a lot of things that we need to do different. I do see uh, a strong student mindset to make sure that things are done differently. We're not there yet, but I'm, I'm very, very hopeful for this semester's incoming class. Yes, we, we look for all students to wanna come to Purdue and be successful. And as a minority engineering program director, we support African-Americans, Hispanic, Native Americans. We support any student that will come to us looking for help, but we're really looking at these numbers and we know not only can we do better, we must do better. There have been alums that have stepped up. A lot of, of support has really come to the forefront and I'm happy to see that. That's not something that I think I would have seen in the 70s. So I think we're in a good place, but we have to see what happens. You know, the proof they say is in the pudding, but the proof is gonna be in what actually happens this year. Yeah, okay. we've seen this in the past. You know, as I mentioned, as a result of the riots of the 60s and the burn baby burn era, that is what caused universities and other institutions to open their doors in some way and let a bunch of us rush in. I, I personally benefited from that. The problem though, I think is that then everybody said, okay, the problem is fixed. And we took our eyes off the ball. And here fast forward 45 years later, we find ourselves again at this situation as opposed to treating this like any other engineering problem where we have uh, milestones that are measurable that we track on an ongoing basis and continue to project into the future, this is not a one-time event. It's got to be a long-term solution. So Tony, in, really you're anticipating my next question because you're talking about success criteria and success processes. Right. And what do you, what do you say you've had this uh, history as a student, you've had this history as a successful businessman, what do you see as the top three items for ensuring success and growth of black businesses and maybe even for black students in engineering? Yeah, I think the criteria for success 
for black businesses is no different than the criteria for success for any businesses. And, and, and I, can't, I can't narrow it down to three that I think are the most important. The number one, particularly for entrepreneurs, for an entrepreneurial business, number one is a high tolerance for risk and a, a high ability to accept failure. Uh, I, for instance, started three other companies that started, that failed before I ultimately acquired my current business that uh, proved to be very, very successful. And I believe I've learned more from those failures in terms of what I was good at, what I enjoyed, and how I wanted to structure my business. I learned more from those failures than I have from, from any successes. And as I've talked to other entrepreneurs, uh, that is true for them too. The second, particularly in large corporate organizations, is the, the ability to delegate. And I, and I think that is the single most difficult leadership attribute to develop because it's so much quicker to want to do things yourself and you have personal skin in the game. So you want to make sure they're successful. So you want to do them yourself. But when you're leading and managing large organizations, when I was uh, executive at Pacific Gas and Electric Company, my purview was 4,000 plus people. And the only way you can manage large numbers of people like that is to delegate. So the secret to delegating is to know that when you're managing professional people, you can either tell them what to do or you can tell them how to do it. But you can't tell them both because now you eliminated any responsibility and degrees of freedom from them. The third, I think, is uh, access to, to capital. And you know the challenge for, for Black people in, in typically is that we don't have access to large resources of individuals that can contribute to our business ideas. We generally don't uh, get well received by banks. But the one thing to remember about capital is that there are always more money than there are good ideas. So if you have debt capacity, Basically, if you have good credit, then you are able to attract finances to a good idea. So being able to articulate a good idea and having decent credit, which allows you to personally have skin in the game, will help you to attract capital. Thank you. I wish you had told me the delegation thing when I was uh, going through tenure and trying to get promoted. Um, <laughs> I think there's a lot of uh, challenges uh, that we see in many of these circumstances now of, of the students, you know, learning skills, the faculty trying to apply their skills in a large organization. Uh, I joke about that as things they didn't teach us in grad school about how to manage a large uh, organization known as a university. One of the most important things though, is that students, faculty, administrators have very different time scales. And they think about uh, the pace of the university in very different ways. Christine, how do you, I mean, you've been a Dean, you've been a faculty member, you're now president elect of a major professional society. How do you, think about communicating and even bridging the gap between students, faculty, and administrators and their concepts of what fast response might be uh, looking at events such as last year's social and racial justice protests. Yeah, that's a really great question. Well, first of all, I'm, I'm an associate dean, not a dean, but I'll take the promotion if you'll give me a pay raise. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, but um, no worries. Um, so I think this is a really important and a very complex question. And what I have really enjoyed about preparing for this, for this discussion is that we as a panel got to talk about a lot of elements of this. And I'm going to try to bring some of those into my answer. Um, you know, each, each campus has a different response. So I'm the only person on this panel that is not from Purdue. And suffice it to say that uh, North Carolina State and other institutions are having the same questions and the same challenges. Uh, it depends on how much work they've done before as to how quickly they can respond. Um, you know, we also as a group talked about the fact that this, some of this is generational. Some of it is personality in terms of the elements. And 
and understanding, you know, what your superpower is or what, as, as Virginia said, you know, understand the needle you're trying to move. Um, that's really important uh, in this whole, this whole entity. So, you know, you mentioned that uh, the, the timeline, you know, for students, students are on campus for four years. And so their dwell time is four years, right? And so something happens in a year and they're not even there the whole year, right? I mean, they're there maybe nine months. And so the amount of time that they spend on campus is, is different. And so they are really wanting to see things happen quickly. And I understand that. I, I did the protest for MLK Day and to free Nelson Mandela, for those of you who remember that, free Nelson Mandela from prison, right? Um, you know, it's, there's so many things that have to happen when we talk about making change. Um, you know, we all have different roles to play. So for example, if you wanna get more uh, black faculty on campus, uh, not just get them on campus, but have them get tenure, retain them, promote them, then there's a lot of things that have to happen. You have to have search committees that are aligned with best practices or promising practices to recruit faculty, to bring them to campus, to successfully uh, get them on campus. And then at a place like Purdue, you have to be able to keep them there, right? Uh, I've had an opportunity to coach some of the women faculty uh, at Purdue through some programs that you all have. And, you know, that is something that's really important is how do you keep people there? Um, so the question is, you know, who does what and how fast does it happen? Um, I believe it's critical to have folks that can speak at the interfaces of these different groups. So folks who can speak to students and speak to faculty who understand the culture. Um, you have to have an intentional, meaningful, strategic, strategic management of the conversation when you're talking about communicating. Um, the action items and the levels of accountability. You know, if you set a goal, if a dean or the department head or chancellor or president sets a goal, um, who's going to keep them accountable? Is it the board of trustees? Is it the alumni? Is it the students? You know, what, what does that mean to, to, to set a goal or just to put out a statement that says how much we hate that George Floyd, Floyd died? You know, well, everybody does, right? Well, hopefully everybody does, but what are you going to do about it? Not just a statement. And I think that that's where the accountability piece comes in. And then there's also a degree of training, informing, educated that is needed by those in the trenches, uh, the allies, the people, the leadership and the community. So if you want to get more black faculty, you have to make sure that the search committees in the departments understand best practices for um, not having unconscious bias. Uh, or some other things that, that may be present, right? And so that doesn't happen overnight. You have, to, you, you have to change minds one person at a time and there have to be allies and someone in leadership has to mandate that we're gonna do this. Um, one group certainly can't do it all um, and ignoring it is not an option. Um, so it, I think it's important to respect the contributions to the conversations so that we move forward. So for example, you will not see me out marching right now. I'm probably too old to do that. However, what you will see me doing is you will see me um, at the American Institute of Chemical Engineers talking about things that we need to do to help the organization. Or you might see me trying to recruit uh, faculty or sitting on the running the promotion and tenure process at the college level and making sure that people have the right information and that they're treated fairly. But you're not gonna see that visibly. And I don't think students as Virginia said, um, students don't necessarily know all the dimensions of what goes on at the university and how the needle has to be moved. Uh, and at the same time, they need to continue to press us uh, on the issue. That doesn't mean that they should just not do anything. So. Thank you. So Maimon, question for you. You've had the experience of the family business. Um, and if I understand, you've managed to get some of your own children to, to join you in the family business. Um, sometimes we hear these debates about uh, continuing industry, more blacks in industry. And then you also, as Christine was just saying, talking about the processes of getting more blacks into academia. And a lot of people turn that into an either or debate in the, in the community. Rather than turning that into a, a, a debate, I'd like to think about a both and. How do we build stronger relationships between universities and industry to provide more synergistic, 
collaborative opportunities for black undergraduate and graduate engineering students and even black faculty as well. You muted. <laughs> Thank you, Virginia. <laughs> Thank you for that question. I'll do the best that I can to, uh, uh, to answer it. And it's, it's, not a, a real, um, it's not a real easy answer, but I think if there's a, uh, an open collaboration between, if you will, industry and the university, and I mean the universities with uh, the president, uh, the deans, et cetera, uh, to develop, uh, if you will, a collaborative um, environment so that Ideally, if uh, some faculty can take sabbatical uh, and then work in industry for a given period of time, I think that gives them certainly an insight on what uh, students should expect and how they can best mentor students uh, to, to be involved in industry. I think the university being involved in the communities, um, just maybe even, for example, we used to have the president of the university come, come, to, the, come to the community, actually come to high schools. And that is a very profound uh, experience for students to see the president of a university like Purdue uh, at a high school, encouraging them to come. Uh, I think that makes a, a big difference and uh, is, is great motivation um, to have that engagement with the community. Uh, probably even looking at those companies that are most successful with recruiting uh, and advancement uh, of uh, African-Americans and retainage, retention, um, become maybe the bellwether of um, the corporations that um, the university should look at and uh, work with them to make sure that uh, they're doing, they also have the best practices uh, going forward. Uh, my real heart is, um, is an entrepreneurship. And uh, it's pretty simple that, um, uh, entrepreneurs are the ones that are going to hopefully make, create the wealth so they can give back. And we have a lot of PhD students uh, on the <clears throat> call, which uh, I think is absolutely excellent because then there's that little bit of a, uh, do I go into academia or do I go into business? And, and sometimes many can do both. Um, you can be in academia, certainly inspiring other students uh, who will then maybe become entrepreneurs or and or you may become an entrepreneur with inventions. Uh, there are a number of black inventors uh, that um, I would encourage uh, the PhD students to, uh, uh, to track and, and just be motivated by them. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you myself that uh, I'm motivated by reading uh, the stories of uh, African-American business people. Um, I'm gonna rub on Tony a little bit. Uh, I'll pick on Tony a little bit, you know, Harvard Business School will teach you how to run a business, but it's a little different running an African-American on business. There, you need to know everything Harvard has to teach, but there are also some, I'll call it street skills that you need to learn. Uh, and, and I've learned those just by reading the stories and uh, the strategies that uh, African-American entrepreneurs have had to use and, and you still use today in order to be successful. And then that word success, um, you know, in my mind, uh, your success is really not based upon how smart you are. It's really how much passion you have to relentlessly pursue your dream. That's what really makes the difference. Um, and, and being able to take that risk and, and uh, as, as Tony said, um, you know, to some extent, throw caution to the wind. Uh, and I tell people every day, the worst thing that can happen is you'll have to get a job. Um, but then you might be successful. And that makes a huge difference because you can do a lot for other people developing wealth in the community. Uh, that is truly uh, what we should be about. And uh, I continually see that uh, in other communities and we need to be able to uh, uh, develop more wealth in our communities. And that's, that's really through entrepreneurship. So, so thank you, Barrett, for that question. I appreciate it and uh, look forward to further discussions and questions. Okay. Thank you. So one of the things that uh, makes my job as moderator easy or easier is when you start answering the questions that are already showing up in, in the Q and A. Oh. <laughs> so, so thank you because there, there was a question about programs and platforms to help prepare graduate uh, students and postdocs for the transition 
of their ideas to a startup. Uh, I think both Tony and Maimon, you've talked about that. I will have to put in a plug for the faculty world because uh, when I was coming through, uh, that was part of the TQM model of the brand of you and being able to think of every faculty member as the uh, CEO of their own startup. Uh, but how would either of you talk about uh, other programs or platforms uh, that you might envision? Well, you know, I, I'm here in the Northern California Bay Area, right down the street from Silicon Valley. And one of the, the big retention tools now for, for tech companies is to grant employees sabbaticals anywhere from three months to a year a sabbatical. And I think it would be, it would make sense if those were more structured such that uh, a tech exec could spend that three, six, nine, 12 month period at a place like Purdue, uh, either teaching entrepreneurship or uh, just in somehow, uh, some way liaising with the, the faculty there to kind of give them an idea of what's going on in tech. So, so I think, you know, I think tech companies would be receptive to, to that sort of thing as a way to make sure their execs aren't just taking, you know, six month vacation doing something that it could help uh, develop them as well as, as develop uh, the pipeline to, to fuel further tech businesses. Sounds good. Cost of living is a little bit cheaper here too. <laughs> There's a reason for that. <laughs> There's this stuff called snow you got out there. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, you know, as, as Tony mentioned um, uh, earlier that uh, one of the challenges uh, and barriers to entrepreneurship is, uh, is access to capital. Uh, and, and there's no doubt about that. Uh, and so my suggestion to all the uh, undergraduates, if you will, is develop a lifestyle now that will allow you to save some money. Uh, one of the advantages that I had, <laughs> the advantage that I had when I was at Purdue is I sent my tuition and room and board bill home, uh, just like everybody else did. And three days later, it was back in my mailbox. And so I called home and said, did you all get this? And they said, yes, we did. And their response was, we think you should pay for it. And I got angry, I got mad, I got upset, but also got determined. And I said, I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna pay for this. And so, at Thanksgiving, I went home to work. Christmas, you go home to work. Spring break, you go home to work. Uh, over the summer, you work. And it also, but it also taught me how to handle money, which is most important. So when I was ready to graduate, I knew how to, if you will, handle money uh, so that you could get more out of it. And the interesting part of the story is access to capital is that in my last semester, my last summer session, because I had to go to summer school because I was behind and uh, started behind, um, I was $300 short. And I could have called my parents and asked for $300, but I was determined I was not gonna call them. And so I beat my head against the wall, trying to figure out what in the world can I do? To, how can I get, I couldn't have, there were no more jobs. I was working as many hours as you could possibly work. I walked by a building that said B-A-N-K on it. It's like a bank. I'll go in there and ask for money. And I went into the bank and I asked, uh, can I borrow $300? And uh, the gentleman said, I remember today, he said, do you have any collateral? And not being a business student, I said, what's that? And he just started writing and writing and writing. And just like a police officer, when you're about to get a ticket, they're, they're writing, but you don't know what they're doing. And he tore off and, and handed me a check and said, here's $300, pay it back in 60 days. The interest rate is 8%. You know, that was my first unsecured bank loan. And I learned from that how to handle money, how to get money from banks. Uh, and that was the last time I actually went to ask a bank for money and, and really needed it. Um, the rule for banks is you want to ask them for money when you don't need it. <laughs> so, when you have, so, when, so when you have a little money, go borrow some money. I, it's, it's really how this whole thing works. It's reverse psychology. But... Don't be afraid to save some money, have a little net worth and let be able to leverage that. Um, 
contacts and relationships that you'll have. There are private equity people out there, there are funds out there that are willing to, uh, in this day and age because of George Ford, probably fund some African-American businesses or, or ideas. Um, I mean, Robert Smith, who is uh, the biggest African-American private equity person in the country, and I don't, don't know, but uh, that's one of the things that they do. They're private equity people that have graduated from Purdue that do private equity and look for businesses to buy and acquire or start. So there are opportunities out there. You just have to start finding the right people and, and develop some, some uh, personal net worth. Um, I mean, I've got some basic, basic finance rules myself. Um, never be dependent on a paycheck. Never be dependent on anyone to give you a paycheck because one day they might bring you a pink slip and you're not ready for that. The other is never have debt on a depreciating asset. I know that's hard to do, but if you can accomplish that, it starts your financial independence going forward. And that's what you want to be is you want to be financially independent. You don't want to be dependent on anyone. So those are my thoughts. You know, personal financial management should be a requirement class not at Purdue and everywhere else for that matter. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So Barrett, I wanted to answer one of the questions in the chat. It's, somebody said, how can black engineers leverage our unique experiences to contribute to science policy? And what I didn't mention when I was talking about Shirley Malcolm is that why I really enjoyed that experience was because the American Association for the Investment in Science really does a lot with science policy, which as a faculty member for at that point, 25 years, I did not have any experience in that realm. And so that gave me an opportunity to actually learn about science policy. Um, and you know, while I am not officially representing the organization here, I am actually working at the National Science Foundation for a year um, in one of their programs. And so I am getting to see front and center kind of what's going on there. But it was because, um, it was because I am, uh, I had that experience. So if you want to get involved with science policy, lots of ways to do it. I mean, I hear that there are very few people who are scientists associated with the government, right? And not like NSF, but I mean, you know, like in Congress and all that stuff. You don't have to do that. However, there are lots of different ways to get involved. And then the way you contribute is you got to learn what it is and what the issues are. And so once you learn, what they are, find an area that you want to work in um, and, and volunteer or, you know, pivot and do some consulting there or, or whatever. So there are lots of different things that you can do. You just have to be intentional and, and start, you know, it's much easier than when we started, right? Well, there was no internet. <laughs> you just got to type in. Some of you see me looking down. It's because I was trying to figure out, okay, where, what's Shirley Maplin's position? Let me figure it out on the phone, right? So you can find this stuff easily out there um, and then just call people up. And, um, oh yeah, so I'll say, why was it so important that I gave Shirley Malcolm that brooch? Why did I mention that? Because you, like he said, you need to get a loan before you need the money. You need to create relationships and connections with people before you need them, right? Mm -hmm. So that brooch was kind of my entry point to her. Um, and then it wasn't until years later, I didn't know why I would be interacting with her later. Start forming those relationships now so that later on you can utilize them when you don't even know. So always be on, on point with trying to make relationships with people. And, and that's a great point, especially uh, your reference to uh, Shirley Malcolm and the AAAS. Um, when I was in DC, that was actually a lot of the younger scientists and engineers were AAAS fellows, um, that they, they were fresh out of their PhD program and they were working at state, they were working at USAID, they were working at OSTP. Um, the, there are a lot of those opportunities, sorry, Office of Science and Technology Policy. Uh, there are lots of those opportunities that are available to people. Um, so Barrett, if I may, um, and it's not just for early career. We have a number of people at the National Science Foundation who are deep into their career and decided they wanted to pivot and do something else. And they went back and became a AAAS fellow. They may be in their fifties, you know, right. so uh, it's never too late to become a AAAS fellow or do one of these uh, Jefferson fellow. Somebody on here was a Jefferson fellow, was it Tony? That, that was me. No, it's Barrett, yeah. I mean, so there's lots of different things. Just get online and keep looking. And, and keep, on, uh, keep on looking. And um, of course, I would be remiss if I did not mention that 
uh, Dean Chang had just has just gotten back from a year in DC. And, and I will say um, it's curious because it's clear that other policymakers uh, don't think like engineers do. And so one, one of the great uh, phrases is sometimes you need a scientist or an engineer in the room to know if you need a scientist or engineer in the room. <laughs> um, and, and I actually have to, to credit that one to uh, Tony Boykin. Um, I'm going to use it. Please, please do t uh, tell him that uh, he said it, or I told you that he said it, or something. Barry Caldwell said. Along these lines, I mean, there are lots of formal ways, but can can you give me a, a an informal way to think about how do we bring other people along? How do we train, encourage additional, not just allies, but as Christine, you said during one of our prior meetings, accomplices? Well, that was Virginia. That was Virginia who Virginia. said accomplice? Yeah, yeah, because yeah. I remember writing it down. I was okay, like, <laughs> my, my apologies, Virginia, because now, now you're going to come after me again. No. Um, <laughs> Well, the accomplice thing, the allyship is important. Uh, an accomplice is someone in a position of power that uh, can affect policy within their realm of influence, and they do so. It's, it's sort of the do the right thing kind of person. And uh, actually, I think this event is, is that type of activity uh, where you do something intentional to generate uh, conversation and to look for change. Accomplices are also, and, and I have to say this, our alums are amazing and they have stepped up and I'm not talking about African-American only. We have alums from all ethnicities that have stepped up to the plate and they're doing things that I haven't seen done since I've been here, uh, at, least, at least as it relates to the minority engineering program. So there's power in all of us to do something to affect policy to create new structures or to dismantle structures that don't work. Some of the things that we deal with that make it complicated for students to even to come to Purdue is in using antiquated policies that simply are not relevant to what we're dealing with. As you get a more diverse uh, university population, things that used to work for white males may not be appropriate for who we're dealing with today. And Purdue is one of the most diverse universities in the world. So we have to look at, look at the policies that we use, look at the structures that are historic and, and question them. It's okay to do that, you know, and uh, we're needed, dismantle and do something that works for the purposes that we're here to accomplish. So I just wanna just mention the, the power that we all have in our own space and understanding the needle. You know, for me, for students, your needle is graduate, finish your degree and move on and make a difference in the world. You know, I have needles to move in MEP. I focus on first year performance. I, I, I focus on transition programs. I find my needles and I'm determined to move them. But there are other things that we can do as well in a broader sense. So the accomplished piece is that person that can make a difference, that can change a policy at the stroke of a pen. It's time to pull the pins out and just start making some changes. I'd like to point out, um, I, I wanna segue from what Virginia said into this question about COVID. There was a question about COVID in there and how that is changing what we do and how we do it. But back to something that she just said, I remember when I was, when I was at Brown and, and NSB and I was all fired up, you know, oh, we're gonna change the world. And, and then I went to graduate school at Georgia Tech and I had to take like transport phenomena, grad level. And I remember talking to my then boyfriend, now husband um, at the time about, I wanna go out and help my people. I wanna leave, you know, I don't wanna be here. I should be out helping my people. And he was like, well, what are you gonna do? I'm like, I wanna help my people. You know, <laughs> it's like this nebulous thing, you know? And it is, okay, that's fine. Go study, please. And so now, you know, years later, I'm able to help my people, so to speak, in a different way. So I think it's important to, to, to piggyback on what uh, Virginia said, to understand where you are in the process and what it doesn't mean to help 
you know, help for a faculty member, assistant professor, that's the world I live in, is to get tenure. So you can be here like Dr. Caldwell has been here for a long time um, and, and make a difference and, and be able to do that. And, and for students like Virginia said, to, to be able to graduate. So, um, but I, I was trying to pivot Virginia, but I had to, the, this question about COVID and, and I don't remember what the question was, but just, you talk about rules and, and different yeah. things. And, yeah. and this is like changed the equation for yes. a lot of people. And, and I, it's impacting us more for a lot of reasons. And generally, generationally, I'm, I'm assuming that there are a number of students who either can't go back to work or got to go back home and help their parents and their families, or maybe they're not going to be able to go to school. It just can you somebody ask the question? And I, I well, I, I do. I do want to say something about COVID. <clears throat> this national, this global pandemic, uh, to me, has biblical proportions. I've never seen anything like this, and the stress that students are under is tremendous. And uh, I can talk about students of color. We're very social. You know, the the academic success center used to be so full that they spill out in the hallways. It's like a desert now. And I'm looking at, at statistics and data and I see more students on probation after last semester. I believe that, you know, I've heard students comments, you know, they may have a situation that's very stressful, <clears throat> very strenuous. I had a young lady that had to make an emergency trip to Texas because she's got an elderly parent that could not, they didn't have heat and they didn't have money and, and she flew there and uh, she couldn't get a break on her homework. You know, it's, and, and these are things, it's, it's not, I don't think it's intentional, but we have to be intentional about dealing with the stress that students are under. You know, you might say, well, this is our policy. This is the way it is. We don't do this. There are times to question policy. There are times to say, hmm, we are, we want to be fair to all students, but here's a situation where if any student is dealing with a dilemma that's very difficult, is there something we can do different? Are we willing to, to have a conversation with the right people so that we can be consistent and do the same for anybody that has a situation? Sometimes it's a matter of understanding what's truth and what's not. But we're, we're in a really different place now. And I do think this is a time when we can question whether policy is appropriate in this COVID space we're in. And I, it's not my call. I'm not faculty, so I don't call that. But I think there's an opportunity there. Yeah, I wanted to, to, to speak to this other, well, I, I guess my colleagues, if they have something to add, I'm sorry, I already spoke. <laughs> No, no, you, you're doing well. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, my cousin just put a question in and I want to, he's 15. Oh. Um, um, and what is the importance of having social connections and or mentors when trying to understand the differences of all the different engineers out there so you don't fall into a field you're not interested in? I'll kind of paraphrase, you know, how do you make the decisions? How do you use your networks to figure out what you want to major in? and make sure you don't choose the wrong thing. Well, considering that uh, it's rarely a linear path, there's rarely a single optimally constrained solution. Um, oh, that's so engineering-like. <laughs> what can I say? Optimally I, I, constrained solution, wow. <laughs> we, we, we'd all like to have one and we'd all, we'd all pay a lot of money for them, but... Um, I'm not convinced that they really do exist. Um, and unfortunately, my optimally constrained solution would be, I would have plenty of time to have everybody answer those questions in exquisite detail and go into all of your experiences and all of your twists and turns. Um, unfortunately, uh, that may not be uh, the solution path that we have available this evening. Uh, so I think for the panelists, we, we may talk about uh, something about some, some interesting glasses of wine or some, <laughs> or some other beverages that, that we might share at, uh, to catch up on some of these stories and follow up on 
what we've done and what we can still do. And some of the rest of us have uh, to figure out what we're going to do next as we're emerging as uh, weeders and trailblazers in the making. Uh, I want to thank you all for participating in this. I, I want to thank the panelists. I, I really want to say that many of the things that we would have said uh, 13 months ago would have been impossible are now exactly how we do things. So having people from all over the country uh, connecting and interacting on this, I think has been tremendously valuable. I, again, want to thank uh, Purdue College of Engineering. I want to thank the panelists. I want to thank most of all, all the panel, uh, the participants. I see that we got way past 75 at some point. Um, thank you all. Uh, this has been a fantastic evening, uh, a fantastic um, emergence. Let's say, let's not lose that energy. Let's not uh, waste this momentum. Uh, and I want to uh, wish all of you a very excellent Thursday, Friday, Saturday events in the workshops and the other aspects of the Black Trailblazers and Engineering event. Uh, Arvind, can you take us out, please? Uh, yes, I just wanted to <clears throat> offer a few concluding remarks. Um, you know, certainly on behalf of uh, Dean Chiang and the College of Engineering, I'd like to add to um, Barrett's uh, comments of uh, words of thanks to all the panelists, uh, Christine, Virginia, Tony, Naaman, Barrett. Um, you covered a lot of uh, really important um, touching and motivating topics um, from black STEM heroes to black student experiences then and now, how to ensure success for black businessmen uh, or engineers, the whole notion of fast versus slow, what needs to be done at what pace, who perceives the pace in response to social and racial injustice protests is it the either or with respect to industry and university, with respect to tech companies, et cetera? And as you responded to all these questions, I know that um, of the many people who are attending today, uh, there are many allies and accomplices, Virginia, <laughs> uh, certainly today. And um, this discussion I'm sure has been very empowering to all those as well. Uh, you also woven topics of social and venture capital <laughs> has needed to dismantle structures, Virginia. And above all, um, through your own, sharing your own stories and examples, uh, you have uh, reminded us uh, of the need to sustain the momentum for change uh, for a long time. So uh, we thank you uh, for these amazing words of wisdom um, and for joining us for this uh, uh, plenary panel uh, in the inaugural Black Trailblazers and Engineering Program. Uh, honestly, I can't wait for you to meet the BT fellows, which you're going to be doing now shortly after that. Uh, and I know that they will have a lot of questions for you. So really look forward to it. Uh, and thanks, a special thanks to Barrett uh, for organizing this panel. Uh, which uh, he, you know, the whole team worked very hard uh, to make this happen. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Barry. Thank the audience for joining. Thanks us. for having us. <laughs>